If you would turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 8 this morning, that would be wonderful. Jeremy, uh, it took a lot of persuasion for him to allow me to come here because, of course, I was dean when he was a student at Prairie. I know stuff. So uh, he gave me a gag order. Therefore, I only tell a couple of stories. This, no, that's not true. Uh, j- j- it was a real privilege uh, to have students like Jonathan and Danielle and Jeremy and Brittany. We're just uh, thrilled as we see uh, God working both in and through them. So uh, we're in Romans chapter 8, and we're going to begin at verse uh, 18. Let me just see if I can. Ah, there we go. Verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Verse 20, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. And not only, sorry, verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So far, at least for right now. My dad passed away on Friday evening, December 23rd of 2022. His final weeks were agonizing pain. Even the slightest movement in his bed would result in audible, deep groaning. It's interesting in our passage that groaning is the theme that keeps it together. Groaning is the main idea here in the passage. Groaning is a deep, personal, Intense agony. And in some cases here, Paul says it is so deep that we cannot even begin to express it in words. Well, in our passage, we find, first of all, ah, there it is. The whole creation groans. It seems strange to us, doesn't it? It seems strange that creation groans. Because in Genesis, we find at least five times that God says about his creation, it's good. In fact, at another time, he says, it is very good. So creation is not uh, created groaning. However, because of human sin... God curses the creation, and so in Genesis chapter 3, we see that God says to Adam, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. And so according to the Apostle Paul, through the curse, creation is unwillingly subjected to futility or frustration. So we see that creation at the same time as it is marked with the good of God's handiwork, 
at the very same time, it is marred with the groaning of the curse. I'm going to give you several illustrations of that in our own experience. The soil that produces the miracle of growth of gardens and crops that we soon are looking forward to is the good of God's handiwork, but at the same time, the soil generates unending weeds, sin's curse. The ocean is an unbelievable source of life, but at the same time, the ocean can generate a tsunami that kills thousands of lives. And because we are part of creation, because as humans we are part of creation, we experience this exact same reality. So let me give you a couple of examples. A relationship brings immense fulfillment. All of us have experienced that. That's the good of God's handiwork. That same relationship can bring incredible emotional pain. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. But at the same time, our bodies inevitably will return to dust. Like my dad in his last days, all creation, Paul says, is groaning. Creation has a universal expression of deep agony because its original goodness is marred by the curse of sin. Creation agonizes because it is not what it was, nor what it should be, nor what it will be. This groaning is the reality that we live. The good guys do not always win. Bad things happen to good people. Life gives us lemons. All is not right with the world. Groaning is life in this world as it really is. And every groan declares the rebellion of humanity against a holy God as the reason for the curse. Now, you might expect in our passage that the Apostle Paul would take this opportunity to demonstrate how believers are exempt from groaning. But he doesn't. In fact, he says in verse 23, and you can, you can look at it, verse 23, and not only the creation, but we ourselves. And then he adds to that, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly. Notice in verse 16 and 17, he's already said, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. And then he says this, Provided we suffer with him. So, Adoption as children of God does not give us a get-out-of-jail-free jail card from groaning, but rather it guarantees our groaning. We groan not only because we have a solidarity with creation, but we also groan because we have suffering with, with, with a suffering Savior. We have sonship with a suffering Savior. So, because you are part of the created order and because you are a believer, what I can assure you of is either you have groaned in the past, you are groaning today, or you are going to groan in the future and perhaps all three. By now you're probably thinking, wow, this is a pretty bleak message. And if you're not discouraged before coming to church today, you sure are going to be going home. This sermon is dragging you into the pit of despair, and you're wondering, Pastor Jeremy, where did you get this guy? And make sure you never bring him again. <laughs> well, what's interesting to me in this passage, and one of the main reasons that I, uh, as I considered it for this morning, is that amazingly the Apostle Paul comes to a surprising conclusion, conclusion that groaning should not lead us to despair. Rather, for the believer, groaning should inspire hope. And in our passage six times, Paul uses that word hope in order to talk about the believer's experience in the midst of our groaning. Okay, I'm going to really uh, go ahead here. Sorry about that. Here's where we are. 
How does groaning inspire hope? Paul uses the illustration in our passage of a woman in childbirth to help us understand the connection of groaning and of hope. There is a deep and intense groaning in childbirth. Of course, I've never experienced that, but so my wife tells me. The only reason a woman would intentionally go through that groaning is because there, ho- there is hope of a miracle of a baby. Not long ago, in fact, in this last month, my son and daughter-in-law invited us to brunch. And they surprised us by announcing we're going to have our first baby. My daughter-in-law is already sick. She is already experiencing groaning that will only become worse. But do you think that groaning has her depressed? I'll tell you what, she is over the moon. Because groaning tells her baby is coming. Groaning inspires hope. Hope. Now, the way that we use, uh, often in our culture, use that term hope is kind of like wishful thinking. For example, if I would jump out of an airplane, which I never have, I hope the parachute will open. There's a... <laughs> that's, that's, You see, there's a real possibility that it will not. I talked to someone who's in the industry, and he said he had had that experience four times where the main chute did not open. So you hope. You have wishful thinking that the parachute will open, but there is no guarantee. And I want to say in the Bible, the term hope is not used as wishful thinking. The, the, the word hope that Paul uses, the idea that Paul is trying to describe for us is a sure confidence based on the character and the promise of God. You can deposit hope in the bank because it is surer than death and taxes. That kind of hope is an anchor for your soul. And so how can you experience hope that will anchor your soul in the depth of groaning Paul provides for us at least three different ways that that is true. Let me go backwards here. First of all, our hope reminds us that the Holy Spirit groans. In verse 26, Paul writes this, The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. The former, the late John Stott, in his book, The Cross of Christ, states, The real sting of suffering is not the misfortune itself, nor even the pain or the injustice of it. Pain, he says, is endurable, but the seeming indifference of God is not. He says, sometimes we think of God as lounging, perhaps dozing in some celestial deck chair. We see him kind of as an armchair spectator, almost gloating over the world's suffering and enjoying his own insulation from it. It is this terrible misrepresentation of God that the cross smashes to smithereens. We are not to see him as a deck, deck on a deck chair, but on a cross. The God who allows us to suffer. One suffered himself in Christ and continues to suffer with us and for us today. God is not un- unaware or uninvolved with the people in, our, in their groanings. Rather, he is with us in our deepest and most agonizing pain, is what the passage is telling us. The Holy Spirit identifies with our groanings, and thus he groans with us, and he groans for us. When we are unable to verbalize our pain, 
when we do not know what to ask in prayer, when our groanings are beyond the ability of our words to communicate, the Spirit intercedes for us. He conveys to God what we cannot put into words, interceding with requests that are consistent with the will of God. In other words, when we cannot speak, the Spirit speaks on our behalf. He links our groaning heart to the heart of the Father. Why should we have hope? We should have hope because the Holy Spirit is with us in every circum- whatever circumstance we are in today. He is with us and he prays on our behalf with his own groanings. Secondly, I'm not very good at clicking. You notice that already. I need another degree in that. Number two, our groaning reminds us that creation will be set free. Paul says this in verse 21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. Now, the apostle John, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, shows to us the future of the created order in Revelation chapter 21. And I'm just going to read a a short snippet of that. So I'm in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Then I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. You see, God's purpose for subjecting creation to corruption and to futility or frustration was not to destroy it, but but rather to deliver it. The groaning that creation presently suffers, that we suffer, is like birth pangs, for it promises a glorious delivery. The pangs do not lead to death, but to deliverance and life and to liberty. The creation that is currently subjected to corruption and futility has a sure and a certain hope. So, what's the point? What am I trying to say here? Oh, let me go back one. The groaning of creation not only declares the rebellion of humanity, but it proclaims a future deliverance by God from that rebellion and all of its consequences, doesn't it? Our groaning reminds us that the last chapter has not yet been written. Sin and Satan do not have the last word. God is the author of the final uh, chapter, and Christ has won and will win the victory. The kingdom that is here is only the first installment, and it will be fully accomplished, accomplished by the kingdom that is not yet. This life and this world is not all there is, and our groanings remind us that the best is yet to come. Thirdly, our groaning reminds us that that believers will be glorified. Paul says this in verse 18, the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He adds in verse 23 and verse 24, we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Now, although our believer's inheritance includes suffering, our inheritance includes much more than suffering. Because of our adoption, there is coming a day when we will receive the remainder of our inheritance. And Paul summarizes that 
in verses 28 through 30. And I'll read that. Verse 28 through 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose... For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Some years ago, I'm told of an elderly missionary couple who returned to the United States after a long career in Africa. In those years, they traveled by ship, and as the ship sailed into the New York Harbor, there were great crowds that were cheering. There was a band that was playing. It was a great welcome home party. But the elderly missionary couple soon realized the homecoming was not for them. On that same ship, there was President Theodore Roosevelt coming back from one of his international trips, in this case, a recreational safari in Africa. Great crowds had come to New York, the New York Harbor to welcome the president back home. The bands were playing. The people were shouting, And he was receiving a hero's welcome. Terribly discouraged. The missionary couple slipped through the multitudes of people totally unnoticed. They had no pension. Their health was broken. They felt defeated. Discouraged. Afraid. They went to a cheap hotel to stay for the night. The wife went for a walk, and when she returned, she noticed that her husband had an entirely different attitude than when she had left. And so she asked him, did the Lord tell you something? He responded, the Lord settled it with me. I told him how bitter I was that the president would receive a tremendous homecoming when no one met us as we returned home. And when I finished, it seemed as if the Lord put his hand on my shoulder and simply said, you're not home yet. Friends, we're not home yet. We groan today. We groan today. but the hope that is an anchor for our souls is that we are going going from groaning to glory. And so Paul, and I conclude with this, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says it far better than I could, so we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. It is beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let's pray together. Our Father, thank you so much for the Church of the Open Bible. Thank you for the decades of shining a light in this community. And I pray for this congregation that your hand of blessing, that your smile would be upon them. I pray for Pastor Jeremy, for the elders, and ask that you would guide, that you would lead them, and that you would honor yourself through their ministry. I pray today for each family that is represented here in this congregation and ask, Father, that in their groaning, that they would have a deep sense that your spirit is groaning together with them and praying for them. Give them a sense of eternity. 
of the reality that there are things that are unseen that are more real than the things that we touch and that we feel and that we are going that we are going from groaning to glory and so minister to each heart this morning i pray in jesus name amen